Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thanks so much for joining me for yet another video in our Rust programming tutorial series. Make sure that you check out the full Rust playlist to learn a lot of other Rust fundamental concepts to help you become a better Rust programmer. Now, what we're going to be talking about in this particular video is a crate for Rust known as the Serdi crate, S-E-R-D-E. -E. And the name Serdi actually has two different parts to it. S-E-R is short for serialization, and D-E at the end is short for deserialization. Now, when you start building out different types of services, let's say REST APIs, for example, or maybe you're building out a CLI tool that's going to interact with a REST API, we need to be able to take data structures that we receive from the remote API or data structures that we need to send to the remote API if we need to, for example, create a new resource. And we need to be able to represent that arbitrary data in a JSON data format as a data structure inside of our Rust program. So the, the whole purpose behind the SERDI crate is that it allows us to transform text data that's in say let's J let's say json format into a rust struct instance and then we can also take a, an instance of a rust structure and we can transform it or serialize it into a data format like json now one of the great things about serdi is that this is actually implemented as a generic library that works with lots of different file formats so some file formats that you might come across are things like JSON or YAML or maybe uh, Apache Arrow, for example, is a columnar data format. But JSON is probably the most popular data format out there. So we're going to just introduce SERDI by looking at JSON, which again was is probably going to be the most important one that you'll come across. But just keep in mind as you start working with SERDI that you can kind of take the same types of concepts and actually use other data formats to interact with other services. This is actually really helpful because if you're implementing SERDI against a remote API that you don't personally develop or have any kind of control over, then you might need to take a different file format like uh, YAML, for example, instead of JSON and be able to transform that text data into Rust objects. So we're going to take a look at how to implement SERDI. It's actually really simple, so hopefully I'll be able to kind of demystify the complexities of SERDI and just really show you the basics about how to implement it here. You can check out the documentation over at SERDI, S-E-R-D-E dot R-S. That's the official documentation site. And then if you go to crates.io, which is the main Rust registry that holds different libraries and command line tools and that kind of thing for Rust, you can just do a search for SERDI right here. You'll probably see the core SERDI library here as the primary crate that comes back in your search results. But then there's actually going to be lots of other formats that are kind of compartmentalized into their own separate crates. For example, we've got SERDI JSON right here, and this is the library that we're going to be using specifically to interact with JSON as opposed to other file formats. If you wanted to do something like work with YAML, for example, then we could do a search for SERDI YAML. Let's do SERDI underscore YAML. And sure enough, here's a crate that appears to work with YAML just fine. But we're going to just focus on the core SERDI library and the SERDI JSON library. Now, the reason that it's important to note that there's two different crates that we need to import into our application with the Cargo CLI is because if you are writing a file format, then you need to actually create a crate that implements the serialization and deserialization types inside of the SERDI library. But if you're simply consuming the SERDI crate in order to serialize or deserialize data using a file format that's already been implemented, then you don't actually really need to touch the SERDI library except to derive a couple of key attributes known as the uh, serialize attribute and the deserialize attribute on your data structures. 
So it's really simple to use, but we need to make sure that we've got Serde, the core, as well as the specific crate for the file format that we're going to be working with installed into our project. So we're going to go ahead and create a completely scratch project. We're going to create a new folder. We'll do a cargo in it. We'll add in our dependencies and we'll start writing some code from scratch to make sure that you've got the understanding of the fundamentals of Serde. Now, before we get into the actual coding, I encourage you, I'm an independent content creator, so any kind of support that you can provide to me helps me to bring you more video content on Rust and other software-related topics. So please head to my channel at youtube.com slash Trevor Sullivan. So make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell next to the subscribe button so that you get notified about new videos when they are released. Also, if you leave a like on the videos or a comment and let me know what you thought of these videos or any other types of topics that you want to see, especially around Rust programming, then please leave a comment and let me know what your thoughts are. All right, so it's time for us to switch over to our VS Code editor here. The very first video that I did in the Rust series actually talks about how to set up VS Code to communicate with a remote Ubuntu Linux server. So this Linux server environment is where I'm going to be writing my code and testing it out. So I'm going to go ahead and just create a project folder here. We'll call this Serdy Trevor. And we generally want to make sure that we use a project name that's not going to conflict with any crate names that we're going to be taking on as dependencies for our project. And then I'll just do Control-K, Control-O, and we'll open up that Sergey Trevor directory, which should be empty right here. Say, yes, I trust the authors because it's just me. And then we'll go into this folder in our terminal and say cargo in it. That'll give us the basic skeleton of a new Rust project here. And then we'll go into our cargo.toml. And of course, we'll see that we don't have any dependencies. So the first dependency we want to add is going to be Serde itself. So we'll say cargo add Serde. As you can see, this is broken down into a number of different features here. And if you check out the documentation for Serde, you'll see that we need to make sure that we include the derive feature so that we can use these attributes of derive serialize, serialize and derive deserialize on our custom data structures. So since the derive feature is not installed by default, I'm going to do cargo add Serde dash dash features and we'll set that to derive. And that should now include that feature, hence the little blue plus sign there in our dependencies. And sure enough, you can see that cargo CLI updates cargo.toml, and that'll get checked into your source control so that you can track different changes to your cargo configuration and any dependencies that you declare in there. Now, the other thing that we need to do is to import any dependencies. So there's a little checklist here. If you go to the using derive page here, it'll tell you, make sure that you include any file format specific crates that you need in order to work with either JSON or YAML or other types of file formats. So we're going to include Serde JSON into our project here. And this is our primary entry point into dealing with the Serde library. So what we're going to do is just import this here with cargo. So we'll say cargo add Serde JSON. As you can see, there are some optional features in here as well, but I don't think we're going to need any of those. So as long as you, as you have the STD or standard crate feature, we should be just fine. So now we've got two dependencies, Serde with derive and Serde JSON. So at this point, we are done with cargo.toml and we are ready to go ahead and write some code using Serde. So what we'll do is come into our main.rs file here. And the first thing that we're going to do is actually use Serde deserialize and serialize because we need to be able to use these attributes inside of our custom data structures or actually technically outside of the data structure. But it's basically a way for us to specify that a custom data structure that we're creating should be serializable or deserializable. So we'll just do use and then Serde, do a double colon. And then we'll put curly braces here because we need the deserialize macro and we also need the serialize macro. Now, once we've imported those types, we can use those types to annotate our custom data structures. So let's say that we're writing an application that allows a pet boarding facility to register new pets that are going to be boarded at their facility. So let's say that maybe we have a dog type. So we'll do a custom data structure down here 
called dog. And this dog is going to be the data type that we want to serialize into JSON or be able to take a JSON string and then convert into an instance of this custom data structure. So let's just give it a couple of attributes here or fields. So we'll do name as a string value, and then we'll do year born as a integer 32 bit. All right, so now that we've got this dog struct here, we can actually come in here and say attribute by using a hash sign here, and then we use the square brackets around here. Then we can say derive, and we want to derive the serialize and deserialize attributes on this dog struct here. So now that's just indicating to the Surday library that we want this particular data structure to be serializable. If you don't include that definition on your custom data structures, then you won't be able to serialize or deserialize this custom data structure. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and use the Surday JSON library. So let's check out the documentation for Surday JSON. If we just head over to the crates.io page for Surday JSON here, there is a documentation link that takes us out to the standard docs.rs site that allows you to document different crates and libraries and that kind of thing. So what we're going to be doing is using some of the functions inside of this crate here. We have something called two string. We have two vec which gives us a byte vector. We have to writer if we want to write to a stream. Uh, we also have to string pretty if we want to pretty print our JSON and actually have indentation and new lines all looking correct, like kind of a structured JSON string that you might find in a file. So uh, the most simple example is just going to be to call to string on our data structure. So let's go ahead and use Surday JSON. And for now, we'll just import the two string function here. And that'll allow us to take a dog and serialize it as JSON so that we can then send it off to a remote service as a string value. And then that remote service can take that JSON string and then turn it back into whatever data structure it needs. So what we're going to do is go into our main function here. And I'm actually going to move this dog struct right above here just so we can have all of our definitions up top and then our main function code down here at the bottom. And we're going to start by instantiating a new dog. So we'll say let dog01 equal dog. We'll set the name field to Cheyenne, which is my dog's name. She's a beautiful border collie. And then we'll say dot two string because that is a heap allocated string type. And then we also want to set the year born. So we'll say year born is 2021, which should be a valid 32-bit signed integer. So now that we've got this dog01 instance here, we can go ahead and convert it to a JSON string, right? So what we can do is call serialize here. This will allow us to serialize the dog. But what we actually want to do is use this up here. So we'll say to string. Whoops, I don't want to change that there. What I want to do is say to string, and this will allow us to send in a borrowed value from our current scope, and then it'll give us back a result containing either the resulting JSON string, or if there's some kind of parsing error that occurs, it'll give us an error instead. And this is a pretty common pattern that you'll see in a lot of Rust libraries where it returns a result that's either successful or not successful. And that's what gives you the opportunity to kind of, kind of handle that error in a graceful fashion. So let's do dog underscore ser, so dog serialized as a string. And then we'll call the to string function here. And we'll simply pass in a borrowed pointer to dog01. And we'll put a semicolon at the end. So what you're going to see here is that because to string returns a result of string, we don't have to declare our data type for this variable because it's inferred by the Rust compiler. And then we should be able to retrieve that string if there is no error. So what we'll do is just use a simple if statement here to check for an error condition. So we'll say if dog serialization dot is OK, meaning that it's successful in serializing the dog, then we'll go ahead and just say print line and we'll pass in the dog serialization dot OK dot unwrap because it gives us back an option type around string. So it could be either a string value or it could be none. And then we'll say else. We'll go ahead and say print line 
and then we'll just print out dog serialization dot error and I'm going to do a debug output on that as well with pretty printing. So we do colon hash question mark and that's debug output with pretty printing or you can eliminate the hash sign there and that will just do debug output without the pretty printing. So let's do a semicolon at the end there and run our program and see what we get. So if we do cargo run, we're going to build our base libraries here and then our application itself. And as you can see right down here, we get back a JSON string with my dog's name and the year born of 2021. Now, we could also add additional fields in here if we wanted to. Um, that's actually for deserializing. So if we deserialize and we have extra fields, then Surday can actually ignore those extra fields and only construct the dog from the fields that are actually defined on the dog struct. So we'll take a look at that when we do deserialization from a JSON string. But there's actually some things that we can customize on the serialization of the dog. So if we head over to the documentation here, you'll see under this attributes section that there's kind of three different levels that we can apply survey attributes on. So we can define the survey attribute at the struct level. We can also define the survey attribute at the individual struct field level. And we also have the ability to specify on enumerations using the survey attribute to customize the serialization of enums and enum variants, which is kind of like a field uh, for a struct, but it's, it's an enumeration value instead of a struct field. So what we're going to do is take a look at some of the different container attributes here. And so container attributes are basically referring to attributes that you can define on the containing data structure. So in this case, we have a dog struct, and that dog is basically the container for the different individual fields that are being serialized to the JSON format. So one thing that we could do, for example, is to rename the serialized data structure. So normally it's going to be a dog, but we could actually tell it to name it something else. You can also rename all of the fields. And so what this is going to allow you to do is to take your snake case. Most typically, you're going to be using snake case. That's just kind of the standard convention in the Rust community for naming variables and fields and things of that nature. But the survey library can actually handle renaming to different standard formats for you. If you want to maybe uppercase all of the field names, you can do that. If you want to use kebab casing, you can do that. If you want to use camel casing, you can do that or Pascal casing, where we use capital letters for each word. So what we can do is come back in here, and I just want you to pay attention to the field names here. So we've got name and year underscore born, just like we defined right here in the actual Rust code. But if we do the rename feature, so let's do survey, and then we'll use rename all, and we'll set it to Pascal case. Now, if we rerun our program here, you can actually see that we're now using Pascal case. So it actually converted for year born because there's two words there that were separated by an underscore in the field definition. It actually converted that to use Pascal case where it takes the underscore out and it capitalizes the first letter of each word in the field name. If we were to change this to like camel case, for example, then the first word is not going to be capitalized. So name, of course, is only one word, so it's not going to be capitalized. But year born, you can see that the first letter is not capitalized, but the second word, first letter is capitalized. So that's a really nice way for you to kind of transform the data without having to do a lot of custom implementation work for your custom data types. Also, for, you can do deny unknown fields, and this is during deserialization where I just mentioned a minute ago that if you have extra fields defined in your JSON text, but you're deserializing from that JSON text into a Rust data structure, then you can basically tell the library, the survey library, that it should reject any additional fields and actually throw an error, which it does not do by default. By default, it'll allow you to have extra fields, but as long as it has the necessary fields to construct the type that you're trying to deserialize as, it'll go ahead and work just fine. All right, now we can also do nested data structures. So let's say that our dog has an owner, right? So an owner walks into our pet boarding facility. They say, I want to board my dog. I want to register my dog with you. Well, that dog has an owner that the dog needs to be returned to after they come pick up the dog from the boarding facility, right? So let's do another data structure here, like struct 
owner or maybe dog owner, just to be a little bit more explicit. Then we'll do a first name since people have first names and we'll do last name as a string as well. And I think that'll be enough for this example. Then on the dog struct, we're going to do an owner field here and we're going to set that to type dog owner. So now each dog can actually have an owner on the dog itself. And it looks like I am getting an issue here. So let me see what's happening. And of course, I just totally realized that it's because we have not allowed our person to be serializable, right? So we need to actually take the derive here for serialization and deserialization. And we need to apply that on any dependent data types as well. So in this case, it's going to be dog owner. Now, the other error that we get right here is that we are missing the owner field on the dog itself. So we need to go ahead and set that. So up here, we'll instantiate a new owner. So we'll say let owner 01 equal dog owner. And we'll say first name is Trevor dot two string and last name is Sullivan dot two string and we'll put a semicolon at the end. And then on the dog struct instantiation right here on line 21, we'll say owner is owner zero one. All right. So that should satisfy the constraints on the dog struct here. And now that we have tagged our dog owner as being serializable as well, we should be able to serialize both the dog as well as the dog owner. So let's run our application again. And as you can see, we still have camel casing applied here. So we've got name, year born, and then down under the owner here, we've got the first name and the last name. What you'll notice though, is that the renaming of fields is only applying to the dog. So this camel casing that we have on the dog's year born field is not being applied to the dog owner because we didn't specify the survey attribute on the dog owner. So if we copy that and bring down the camel case to the dog owner, then we should apply the same rule or convention to the naming of those dog owner fields. So it's really a per data structure setting that you can use to encode those fields as different formats. Not really encode, but just kind of transform. All right, so that is serialization in a nutshell. There's a lot of other stuff that we can do, so feel free to check out these different attributes that we have right here. But let's go ahead and start talking about deserialization from a JSON string back into a Rust data structure. So what we'll do for now is go ahead and just copy this right down here, so this text that we got, and we're going to put that into a raw string in our application. So let's do fn deserialize. And we'll go ahead and create a string here. So we'll say let JSON string equal. And then I'm going to create a raw string here. And we'll terminate that with a semicolon. And I'm just going to paste in this JSON right here. And actually what I'm going to do is remove the camel casing here because I don't want to use camel casing in this particular instance. I just want to use the raw type here. So let's do another cargo run and we'll just copy the correct structure here and we will paste it in. Now, one other thing that I want to do is I don't really want all the JSON on one line here. So what we're going to do is actually change the function call here to two string pretty. So we'll do two string pretty and change the call to two string to be two string pretty instead. And that should give us a nicer format here of our JSON. So feel free to use either two string or two string pretty. And then I'll paste in this updated JSON right here. So that's quite a bit more readable uh, vertically. And so now what we're going to do is take this JSON string variable that just contains a slice of string, and we are going to deserialize it as a dog and owner, right? So what we're going to do is take JSON string, and instead of calling it to string this time, we're going to use the from string right here, and that will take a type of T, in this case, a string, and turn it into uh, from JSON text into an object, right? So let's go ahead and do import the from string function here. 
and then we'll come down after the string and we'll say let dog d seer and say equal to from string and then we'll pass in our slice of string which is json string now as you can see in this particular case the rust compiler has no idea what data type we are trying to take this json string and deserialize it to right we could have a dog type we could have an antelope type we could have a tiger type the rust compiler simply has no way of knowing what this json string represents so we actually have to tell the rust compiler what data type we want to deserialize this json string as so in this case we're going to use the turbofish syntax in order to specify the data type so we do a double colon after the function name here and then we specify our data type as a generic argument and so this is going to be of type dog all right so now we have this in a variable and this is going to be another result type here. So if the deserialization process is successful, then we'll get the dog object in return. And if there's an error, then we'll get an error. So once again, we'll implement similar logic to what we did right up here during the serialization process. And we will check to see if is okay. We'll say dog deserialization dot is okay. Then we want to run some code. Otherwise, we want to print out the error, right? So we'll say print line, do error pretty print, and we'll do dog deserialization dot error to get the error. And then if the result is okay, so if the parsing is successful, then we'll go ahead and take dog deserialization dot okay, which will give us the actual result. And then we need to unwrap it from an option type. And we'll go ahead and do a pretty print on this as well. So we'll say string placeholder and we'll do colon hash question mark and we need to close our parentheses and we also need to implement the debug attribute because we need to make sure that the dog is uh, interpretable as a debug string for this format specifier right here so we'll come up to dog and we'll say derive debug and same thing for the owner since that's a child field of the dog under the owner field right here we have a reference to dog owner so we need to make sure that we're able to debug print both of those data structures so now we need to call our custom deserialize deserialize function right here somewhere from our application so let's go ahead and maybe move all this code into a separate function called serialize test paste that in and then under main we'll do deserialize and we'll say serialize test but we'll comment out the call to serialize test. So it's going to complain that we're not ever calling this function. That's totally fine. But uh, right here, we're calling deserialize. And so that should kick off this function right down here. So let's do a cargo run right here. And as you can see, we get this representation of a dog instance of our data structure because it's prefixed with dog here. So that was successful. But we can actually very easily force this to fail, right? Because if we have invalid JSON data, you know, JSON has a very specific data structure where fields, fields are separated by commas and field names have to be surrounded in double quotes and we have to use colon, not equals. Uh, we use the curly braces here to denote a new object. So if we said something like name is equal to a numeric value, like one, two, three, for example, that will most likely fail. And sure enough, right down here, we get an option wrapping the error, which is that the type is an integer or numeric value in JSON, and it expected there to be a string value. So that is line number 53 executing right here because there was an error during parsing of the dog struct, and that was reflected in the error that we received. But it's really nice because it actually tells you exactly what the error is. So you can literally just look at the error and say, oh, I have an invalid data type. So anywhere that I have an integer defined, like maybe year born, well, no, that looks right because I know that that's an integer value. And then I could see that I had one, two, three right here. So that's another integer value. So I know that that's probably the one that's causing the problem because a name as an integer doesn't really make sense unless you do some kind of transformation on that field. 
Also, you'll notice that the owner was serialized just fine. Um, but what happens if we change the name of the field? Let's say that we did camel casing for just one of the fields for the owner. Well, Rust doesn't know that, right? So it's going to tell us that we are missing the first name field from our owner struct here. So of course, we can go back and fix that. And so there's just a bunch of different issues that are caught. Also, we mentioned earlier how extra fields are discarded by default. So maybe we had a breed field here that says, you know, Great Pyrenees or something. And so if we do cargo run on that, you can see that the dog is still deserialized correctly, even though we have extra fields in our JSON data, because the fields that are defined on the data structure right up here have been satisfied by our JSON input here. So we can't be missing any fields, but we can have extra fields in our JSON input unless we define the attribute that we talked about earlier. So if we go up to container attributes and take a look at deny unknown fields, this is going to cause our deserialization to fail if there are any extra fields. So let's go up to our dog data structure here where we defined that breed field and we'll just add in the, actually it's going to be a survey attribute. So we'll do survey deny unknown fields. And then if we do a cargo run right here, you can see that we now get an error because that attribute is in, in, in indicating to the survey library that we can't have any extra fields in our JSON. And because we're trying to deserialize a dog that has a breed value, but the dog struct doesn't include that breed value, we now are going to get thrown an error. So two ways that you could fix this are to either eliminate the breed entirely from the JSON input, or we could go ahead and implement the breed as a field on the dog struct, depending on what makes the most sense for you. So of course, now we're going to get an error because we are trying to, to uh, create a dog without a breed. Let's just say breed Kali right up here. And we need to do dot two string as well. And now you can see that this works perfectly fine to deserialize because now we've defined that breed field on the dog structure here. So that's just kind of an introduction to the survey library and how you can serialize and deserialize your own data structures. Feel free to play around with this. Make sure that you kind of play around with nested data structures because, of course, you have to do derive, serialize, and deserialize on your nested data structures in addition to the root data structure that you're trying to serialize or deserialize. Feel free to also play around with the different casings. So if you want to do camel casing or Pascal casing transformations or anything like that, you know, play around with that attribute. And then you can also take a look at the individual field attributes down here as well. So if you wanted to maybe rename one of the fields to something specific, we could maybe say go down to breed. We could implement this survey attribute specifically on this field right here and say maybe we want to call it um, dog breed instead. So we could say dog breed right up here. And then if we try to deserialize, it'll actually look for dog breed because it says unknown field breed and it expected right behind my head here dog breed right over here. So even though the field on the data structure is called the breed field, the serialized version, when it tries to deserialize, is actually going to be looking for dog breed. So what we can do is go down to our serialized JSON string here, change this value to dog breed, and that will correctly be parsed into the breed field on the dog structure here. So check out the different field attributes that you can apply to individual struct fields. Check out the container attributes that you can apply to enumerations and custom structs. And also check out the variant attributes, which apply to enumeration variants as well. So feel free to check out the other documentation in Survey, but hopefully this gave you at least a rough idea of how to get started doing serialization and deserialization. And again, don't forget that Survey also supports many, many other data formats in addition to JSON. JSON just is generally the most popular one, but feel free to try out the other data format libraries for Survey and see how well they work. All right. Well, thank you for watching. I appreciate you joining me for another video. Again, please support this channel since I'm an independent content creator. Subscribe to the channel, leave a like, follow the Rust programming tutorial playlist, which this video is going to be part of. And also just leave a comment and let me know what you thought of this video. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.